Do you wanna get some ideas about servers? What sort of servers could you actually be building? Of course, servers, you're generally gonna find them in the corporate world. You've got big servers, you've got rack servers, tower servers, you've got blade servers, different types of physical servers, virtual servers. So if you're thinking about building some servers, in a home lab environment, of course, a home lab being your own learning space at home. You could even stick a home lab in an in a office and it's really, it's really an office lab then. But 20 ideas about what sort of servers you could actually be building. Oh, and also, you can go and spend a fair bit of time actually setting up a home lab on your infrastructure at home. There's actually another easy way to do it if you don't wanna spend a whole lot of money and you make it a lot easier on yourself by actually sticking it up on the cloud. There's this great company called Liquid Web and they actually offer a full VMware environment directly on the cloud. One of the nice things about having it in the cloud is that you can access it from anywhere. You don't have to have a physical computer to build your VMware or your virtual servers in there. You can actually spit that all up and spin it directly up on the cloud. So whether you want your own server, your own pool of servers, whether you want to play with VMware's private cloud, go and check it out down below. And thanks so much to Liquid Web for sponsoring this part of the video. So of course, in a corporate environment, you've got physical servers, right? You've got a server rack, server cabinets, you've got data centers that are full of routers, switches, storage units like SANs and NASs. And then you've got servers, physical big pieces of infrastructure that are deemed as servers. But the reality is that any form of computer any virtual machine can essentially be converted into a server if it's servicing something. What we're gonna be talking about when we're talking about servers. So if you've got some files on a computer and people in your home access that computer for specific things, well, in a way, that computer is sort of acting like a server. It doesn't have to actually be sitting on a big computer. Running on a laptop, running some server software, and then that laptop is sort of acting like a server. So before we even start talking about what I'm gonna be doing from a virtual server perspective, you've got to think about the underlying operating system. Of course, any server can have a different operating system running on it. You could have Windows Server running on it with some server software, and that physical computer, a desktop, a laptop running Windows Server is acting like a server because it's now running server software onto it. You've got Linux, there's lots of different flavors of Linux available. You've got Ubuntu, Ubuntu has a server edition. CentOS has a server edition. If you wanna get into virtualization, well then you're talking about technology such as VMware. VMware has this software called ESXi, which is essentially a operating system that converts your computer into a hypervisor, into a server. You've also got Citrix. Microsoft have their own version as well called Hyper-V, where you can actually install Windows Server onto a computer and then commission that server as a Hyper-V server. So you really got to have a think about it, that anything that you're going to be building is going to, of course, have the underlying server technology running onto it to then be able to service something. Now, in some cases, they'll tell you a specific software that you can actually be running, but we're not gonna cover how to actually do that. We're gonna be summarizing all of the things that you could be building, but then you go away and actually go and research it yourself. The best, best, best way that I learn is to actually go and do it myself. Let's now start with number one and we'll work our way up. Are you gonna deploy it as a virtual server? If you're looking at building a server of some sort, if you're looking at getting a desktop, getting a laptop, you can really use any form of computer to actually be setting up that computer as an actual virtual server. Building a hypervisor. So this could be potentially removing the operating system that's on there. Let's say it's got Windows 11 running on it and you install VMware's ESXi. You've got Citrix, Citrix. You can go and install Citrix Zen server onto the actual computer. And that is now the operating system that then allows you to go and build a whole bunch of VMs or virtual machines within that operating system. Anybody who's anybody who works as a systems administrator, an engineer of some sort, somebody who does technical support in a business needs to know about virtualization. So this is a perfect thing that you could go and try yourself. Now the core essential piece that every single business to some extent will have, at least if they've got servers, we'll say, is they're gonna be having some sort of a domain set up on what's called a domain controller. So you need to go and build yourself a domain controller running Windows Server on your computer. So you can install Windows Server 2022 as a VM on that computer and then go and build and promote that server into a domain controller. And then you're essentially gonna get Active Directory set up 
on that domain controller. And then the domain controller essentially becomes the manager for your entire domain. And then of course in Active Directory, go and configure all of the OUs, the organizational units. You can build your users, your computers, security groups, all of that. Little plug for my training course down below. I've got a link to a full course there around Windows Server. I've got links around Windows administration in general computer network basics, all of that. So go and check that out. All my courses, we go into a lot more detail around AD and domains. Then move into DNS. Now DNS is something that is sort of essential uh, to really get resolution of names within a business or within computer to IP, a host name to an IP. So what are we talking about when we're talking about DNS? Well, if you go to www.emilioaguero.net, which is my website in the background, resolves to an IP address. An IP address, wouldn't that be annoying if you had to remember all these IP addresses? Well, you don't have to do that because DNS does the translation for you. In a work environment, in a home lab environment, you essentially do the same thing. And you can actually build your own DNS server. Again, you could use Windows Server. You could have this running on a domain controller. You could have a standalone DNS server. You could even build a DNS server on a Linux box that actually manages the DNS records between all of your devices. So how do computers on a network get their IP address? Like you're plugging in a computer into a network and it automatically just gets a 192.168.0.3 IP address. How does it do that? Well, there's two ways. One is a static IP, somebody physically going in and putting in the IP address. The other way is DHCP. Somebody actually going and setting up a DHCP server and then it's dishing out IP addresses across your network. So go and build yourself your own DHCP server. Few things that you could do here, you could actually go and actually do this on a Windows server as well. Build your own dedicated Windows box, a VM running DHCP. Again, you can also do this on a Linux box. You've got TV shows, you've got maybe some movies. You go on a trip somewhere, a vacation, on a holiday, and you've recorded a whole bunch of videos on there. We can centrally manage all of this on a media server, a dedicated machine for managing all of your content. And the great thing is there's applications such as Plex, which I absolutely love. You can set up Plex, you can scan all of your files and download all the cover art of your TV shows and things like that if you really want to. It's really, really cool. And then you can literally go and grab maybe an iPhone, an iPad, another sort of device, an Apple TV. It finds a Plex server out on the network it'll talk to it. So it's really, really cool media server. Very similar to a media server is a file server, a spot to actually manage all of your files. And yeah, you may already have something like this. You've maybe already got a computer that has a whole bunch of files on there. If you're running Windows Server, for example, you can actually add some file server services, roles and services and features on that computer. You can take advantage of things such as SMB and KIFS shares. You can take advantage of maybe NFS. You can set up security groups to actually allow only certain files to be shared with only certain types of people. If you want to get really fancy, you can go and build yourself a NAS. Now a NAS, of course, is a real physical device that you can go and buy. You can go buy a Synology NAS, for example. Well, you can also go and install some free software onto your computer and convert it into a NAS. True NAS is one of my favorites. You can go check that out, go and install it, go and play around with it, and you can convert it as a NAS. And then essentially you make this server accessible out on the network and centrally manage them in one spot. You probably use Gmail, you probably use Yahoo, Hotmail. Hotmail is so old. But what if you could run your own email server at home? And the great news is that you can actually do that in your home lab. A lot of companies, most big corporates are gonna use some sort of a mail server, something like Exchange. You can get Exchange out on the cloud, right? If you have Microsoft 365, you can actually get an Exchange environment spun up that way. But there's a lot of companies that are using Exchange on-premise, Exchange as an actual server. So you can go and download Microsoft Exchange for free to be able to trial it for 180 days off the Microsoft website and then you build a VM as an exchange server. You go and set it up as a mail server and then actually manage emails directly from your own VM. You can sort of split this next one up into two different things, but we're here talking about a firewall and a proxy. A firewall, of course, well, you have a physical firewall potentially sometimes on a router. If you've got a home router, it's probably got some sort of a firewall built into it or a modem. You may have your own separate firewall, a physical appliance, a physical hardware uh, that is running as a firewall. Great, and a lot of companies will do that. But you can also get software-based firewalls. So you can build a server as a firewall. You could also build a proxy. Well, what's a proxy? So essentially a proxy server acts as a bridge between a host server and a client server. Essentially sends data from a website to your computer's IP address 
and it passes through this proxy server. So only specific access is allowed in or out. You could do authentication and things of that nature. One that I love is PFSense. Go and check it out, download it completely for free and you can set up a proxy and a firewall and you know what, this is something that is awesome. If, you, if you're wanting to know more about networking, if you want to know more about routes, you want to know about firewall rules, try PFSense, get it. Wouldn't it be great if you could actually run your own website in your home lab, at least learn about the technology. And yes, you can by building a web server. One of the most popular CMS, essentially a full platform for websites is a program called WordPress. You can install WordPress completely for free. You'll install all the backend stuff like PHP, MySQL, like the database and all of that in the background. And understanding a little bit about WordPress is actually gonna be one extra little thing that you could have on your CV. And because it is one of the largest web platforms out there, you having those skills will put you a little bit more in high demand. So go and play around with WordPress on a web server. Do you love gaming? I love gaming. And what you could do is you could build your own gaming server. That way you're not reliant on having to go and source all this stuff directly off the cloud. You can actually have it dedicated in your own space. Something that I love about game servers is you could actually host your own LAN party at home or go and share a space, get all your friends together to bring their computers. And then you could actually be running the server, the game server directly on a VM. And then it's sourcing that game that's running running all of the grunt from your server. You could build your own Minecraft game server. Wouldn't that be brilliant? Something that is used in every company, any good company anyway, is some sort of a server that is managing backups. Pretty essential, I think. You need to be able to back up your servers. So get a backup server built. There's lots of technologies out there. You could try StorageCraft, you could try Backup Exec, you could try Commvault, you could try Veeam. There's all of these different sorts of platforms for backing up. You can then learn a little bit about the differences between an incremental backup, a differential backup, a full backup, retention periods, how long you wanna be keeping the data. All that sort of stuff is gonna give you a treasure trove of knowledge when you're managing backups. How about a security server? Now we're not talking here about a firewall or a proxy server necessarily, this is now a server that is managing security. If you've got things such as CCTV, maybe an alarm system, anything like that can actually be centrally managed in a security system. Most companies out there are gonna have some sort of security. Maybe the door passes to get in. Maybe they do have cameras around the premises. If you wanna get really fancy, you could set it up as what's called a DVR, or digital video recorder. Go and buy yourself a few cameras, stick them around your house, and then centrally manage them on this DVR security server. Tied very closely to that would be a smart home server. You know, we're all familiar with your uh, Alexas, with your series, with all of these sorts of platforms. Wouldn't it be nice if you could actually get all of your tech talking to your own server and actually centrally managing all of these IoT devices that are just everywhere now, centrally managing them, make sure that they're not going out to the internet, keep them secure, and you can control things even more. And you could potentially do a lot more by hosting this management internally rather than giving it to the big corporates. Our next one here is a print server. Every company has printers. Every company at least has some sort of a print server running where all of the printers are installed, where all of the drivers are installed. This is where maybe you have things such as follow me printing. This is somewhere that you can maybe manage the follow me printing sorts of services. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, if you've ever seen a printer where you have to go and swipe a pass, well, that is controlled and managed by some sort of a print server software. Go and play around with it. If you've got a printer at home, add it into a print server and then get some other computers out on your network to connect to the printer via your print server. Now, with all of these servers running around, you've got all these VMs everywhere now, you wanna, of course, make sure that everything is running well, everything is running healthy. A monitoring server, a server that you can monitor all of your servers. You can actually monitor traffic coming in, traffic coming out, see things going a little bit odd. Like if one of your virtual servers is running a little bit too hot or it's shut down, wouldn't it be nice for you to be alerted when something like that happens? You can actually manage all of this monitoring using lots of different awesome platforms. A few that I love, you can try them for free as well. PRTG and Zabbix, set them up in your environment so you can actually get a good snapshot on what's going on in your home lab. Next is a database server. Database servers are one of those things that you really need to know a little bit about because applications, web servers are all gonna be talking to some sort of a database server. If you've gone and deployed a very, very big product out in a company, chances are it's gonna be getting information or at least it's gonna be storing stuff in some sort of a database. 
There's the big guys. You've got Microsoft SQL. You've also got Oracle and there are others, but you can also go and try MySQL by yourself for free. So if you're gonna build yourself perhaps a web server or you're gonna build yourself a monitoring server or an application server or something like that, rather than having, for example, WordPress install its own database on its own on the same server, why don't you have WordPress talking to a different server, a different database server, and get that connection between the web and the database by having them on two different boxes. To make sure that you're not gonna get overwhelmed with load, why don't you look at a load balancing server? So if you're running a big website, you're getting a lot of traffic on that website, you're getting all these hits, well, they're all going to one single spot. What a load balancing server could do is you can actually load balance, put the traffic between a pool of servers. So rather than having one central box, you could maybe have two or three, and then a user that tries to access the website goes to server one, then the next user goes to server two, next server goes to server three. So it helps you essentially to balance the load. Technology that I love is HA Proxy. Go and download it for free, HA Proxy, to set up a load balancing server. Now, how do you make sure that all of these servers, all of these applications are up to date? So if you're running Windows Server or Windows 11 in your home, you need to patch these. Microsoft, they release updates for good reasons. They want you to make sure that you're secure. So go and try WSUS completely for free. You can install it as part of your Windows Server, and then you can get all the computers that are of a specific flavor of Windows, for example, to talk into your WSUS server to then centrally manage it. If you want to patch servers of other operating systems, if you want to patch applications, there's a whole range of other patching apps that you can get set up on this patching server to centrally manage all of it. And it just makes it so much easier rather than you having to go in server by server and manually update things, you can go and centrally manage it and you can get a health check on whether your things are up to date. Now you wanna keep track of everything, so I recommend setting up some sort of an asset register, something that actually can keep track of where things are at and what the purpose of certain things are, what operating systems they've got, when they last booted, all of this sort of stuff. But having a dedicated box for asset management will help you a whole stack. An app that I love is one called LAN Sweeper. You can actually install it onto a server. It can scan your network and then pull this information into one central spot. And then you can actually see what things are looking like on your network. The IP addresses, the host names, the specs of all of your stuff, the location, all of that sort of stuff you can actually set up in a asset management server. And finally, how are we going to access all of this stuff from outside of your home lab? So if you're in your home, if you've set this up at home, you've set it up in a business, your own home lab environment, but what if you're outside of that network? What if you wanted to keep your home lab completely isolated? Well, something that is really helpful is to actually have like a jump box or a jump server, like a remote access server, a server that almost acts as the entry point into your network. The last, last thing that you wanna be doing is exposing your home lab and all of these beautiful servers that you've been building out to the internet. Don't do it. A lot of people do that. But what you could do is you could set up a dedicated jump box, almost like a hop into your network, but then that is completely isolated from everything else. It could be behind a DMZ firewall. It could be set up in this completely isolated environment. And then that acts as the next hop for you to then get access to a few more things. But you sort of need to go through this secure jump box before you can get anything else. Let me know which ones you're gonna wanna go try down below in the comments and stay tuned for the next video where we continue talking about tech. Right now, we're talking more about the home lab. We'll see you then.